1 Kings 15, verse 25. This is God's word, eternally true. Nadab, son of Jeroboam, became king of Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah. And he reigned over two, year, two years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, walking in the ways of his father and in his sin, which he had caused Israel to commit. Baasha, son of Ahijah, of the house of Issachar, plotted against him, and he struck him down at Gibbethon, a Philistine town, while Nadab and all Israel were besieging it. Baasha killed Nadab in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, and succeeded him as king. As soon as he began to reign, he killed Jeroboam's whole family. He did not leave Jeroboam anyone that breathed, but destroyed them all according to the word of the Lord given through his servant Ahijah the Shilonite. Because of the sins Jeroboam had committed and had caused Israel to commit, and because he provoked the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger. As for the other events of Nadab's reign and all he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? Here ends our reading. There's a response of thankfulness. It's printed for you there in your bulletins. The word of the Lord. Thanks, to God. Thanks indeed. Let's pray. As we look at the book of, of Kings, um, we see something that sometimes we see in a movie or maybe uh, your dad or your mom said this to you when you're a kid and they said, um, if you do this thing, this punishment will come to you and you can bank on it. Know that'll happen. Uh, and, and that is, is given to you as a kid to know this is not something to mess with. Uh, my mom, my dad, my parents are serious about this. And, and so I'll, I'll uh, take care uh, to walk in their ways this way. Well, one of the things we see in First and Second Kings is this message continually that the words of the prophets come true. And a lot of times in Kings, what we see is that a prophet will say something in one chapter, and then many chapters later, that thing will come true and most of the time there's a little reference back. And we see that here in this, this passage. Ahijah the prophet had come to Jeroboam and said certain things would happen. And now they happen. And there's this little, not even a footnote, even stronger than that, statement that the word of God predicted through Ahijah the prophet has, has come true. And we might think that that's a distant thing, but it's not because... Uh, Paul, the apostle in Ephesians 2 and 3, says the whole Bible can be summarized in this way. A foundation of the prophets and the apostles, the Old Testament, a foundation of the, of the prophets, and the New Testament, a foundation of a pro the, the apostles that the church rests on. It rests on this testimony. And so we have the word of the prophets, as Peter says in 2 Peter 1, made more sure for us. And the words of the prophets, that is for us, the Bible, Old and New Testament, continues to come true, and it's a sure thing that we can bank on. And so as you look in your outline this morning, and we look at this passage, and, and look at the, con the, the contours of this passage, we see that God is speaking this, speaking this to us today, saying this, number one, bank, bank on the cause and effect bank on the cause and effect declared in the Bible. The Bible says certain things are true and certain things are false. The Bible says certain things you are to do and certain things you are not to do. The Bible says if you do this, this will be what happens. These are the consequences of that. We see that a lot like in Proverbs, right? The person who does this winds up with this. But the person who does this other thing winds up with this different set of consequences. And that's true, and we're to realize that, that as we see and perceive and read cause and effect in the Bible, commands of God, things that we're to do, a direction we're to take, or things we're to avoid, when we see those things in the Bible, and consequences are named in the Bible toward those things, we're to know this is going to come either instantly or later. We don't know when, we're not sure of the timing, but it's sure, it will come. And we see an example of a, a delayed consequence here. 
Jeroboam is given the threat, but it's son, his son later, still during the lifetime of Ahijah, the prophet who gave the prediction, uh, experiences it. And so uh, when we are uh, in our lives and, and sometimes we do something that's wrong, we realize that it's wrong, just the fact that nothing happens doesn't mean that those consequences aren't going to come. That cause and effect is still happening it's just the effect, the timing of it is uncertain. Uh, we see this throughout uh, scripture when uh, different uh, threats are given about exile. Uh, first threats are given about the exile loads and loads of years before it actually happens. And certain kings then uh, are faithful in light of the threat and they push back the exile. Uh, and, and, but, but the exile comes, doesn't it? The cause and effect of the Bible is, is sure. Um, so God says to us basically things like this, 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 certain attitudes, certain behaviors, certain responses, certain things we might say will bring certain consequences. And we're to know and not fool around with that these consequences will happen even if they don't instantly happen, right? Like Adam and Eve in the garden. On the day you eat of it, you will die. And they didn't die utterly. Spiritually, there was a death there. But physically, they didn't die. But yet, those consequences did happen. Adam and Eve died. It was a delayed effect, but nonetheless, an assured, a sure effect, an assured effect. Um, so, in this passage here, if you flip your page back, probably in your Bibles, chapter 14, verse 14. Chapter 14, verse 14. Ahijah the prophet approaches Jeroboam after Jeroboam has introduced all this wickedness and false worship into Israel, the northern kingdom over which Jeroboam reigned. And he promises that the Lord would cut him down. If you look just before that in verses 9 through 11, Ahijah the prophet told Jeroboam the Lord would cut off every male related to Jeroboam. Those are verses 9 through 11 in chapter 14. And, and then Jeroboam, his kingship would be ended. Now, Jeroboam had a potential dynasty that was promised to him, if you really want to flip fast, just another page back, probably in chapter 11, verse 38. God had promised to, a lot, to Jeroboam that if you're faithful to me, if you walk in my ways, you'll have a dynasty just like David's. An enduring dynasty that will go on and on if you walk in my ways. That's chapter 11 before Jeroboam has taken the throne. But then he doesn't. And this uh, threat not only to be cut down himself, but also for every male related to him to be cut down um, comes about. And so chapter 27, or sorry, not chapter 27, uh, chapter 15, verse 27 um, while Nadab, Jeroboam's son, is at war fighting the Philistines, Jeroboam's son, Nadab's at war fighting the Philistines, the Lord cuts him down. Um, there's a, a coup that happens, or if you're not so sophisticated, a coup. Uh, chickens like those. Um, there's a coup that happens, and which is a, a thing that we see over and over, especially in northern, the northern kingdom. All these assassinations of kings, the wiping out of the family, and another family coming to power, and then that king getting assassinated uh, as well. And this happens. Uh, uh, Baasha, who we've read about before because we were dealing and interacting with Asa's life. Uh, Baasha comes up. He's from a different family. He's not Jeroboam's family. And he kills Nadab, Jeroboam's son, while Nadab is fighting this battle against the Philistines. And then when Nadab comes to power, he makes sure to kill all of Jeroboam's descendants. Not just Nadab, but everyone else, so that nobody has a claim to the throne who would come against him, Baasha, uh, later. And so the words of the prophets, God's declarations of cause and effect, come true surely. So A, in your outline there, don't mess with God. <laughs> don't mess with him. Not that he's against you. That's your next little par uh, parenthetical thing. Not that God's against you, but don't mess with him. If he says, you know, if you do this, this is going to happen. 
Don't try it out to see if it's going to be true. Don't try it out thinking it might not happen. Don't mess with that. It's going to happen. The effect of the cause, which would be your sin, is going to come about now or later. So don't mess with God. Not that he's against you, but don't fool around with unfaithfulness. That's your blank. Don't fool around with unfaithfulness to him. So verses 26 and 27, this all happens. These things, God said, if you walk in my ways, you'll have an enduring dynasty through Ahijah the prophet. But if you don't, I'll rip it from you. And Ahijah messes with God, doesn't he? He messes with God's word. He thinks the cause and effect that God has declared to be true will not happen. He does it anyway. He sins and, and, and walks away from God. And, and this comes about in fact. He messes with unfaithfulness. So the message is here for us. Crime doesn't pay, so to speak. Or as Paul puts it and reaffirms in the New Testament, yes, God's word is, God's word is still true. Uh, Paul says in the New Testament, God is not mocked. A man will reap what he sows. And if he sows to his sinful nature, he will reap, as the old King James puts it, the whirlwind. <laughs> right? His life will be chaos. But if he reaps toward the spirit in him, he will have blessing. So cause and effect is, is in motion. But just don't test God. Don't test me in this. Um, our, our former uh, pastor, um, Tim Bailey, up in Bloomington, he just retired. Um, uh, but, but he talks about with, with kids and his grandkids, you know, they always, when they're crawling, first crawling, they want to go toward a, a plug. <laughs> Find that plug, you know? And he would say, even with his grandkids, don't do that. And they would stop, and then they would look away, and they would scoot forward a little bit. He said, don't do that. You know, and he'd swat their hand, you know, and, and, and to get to train them not to do that. Don't test me in this. Um, and, and, and this is from, you know, his care and for, for his kids and then for his grandkids. He doesn't want them to get um, uh, hit or electrocuted. I was told by Tim McDonald, who's an electrician, a former member of our church, that when they say you're hit when you get shocked, you're electrocuted, that means you're dead. <laughs> Um, but but God God does this, so don't mess with Him. Um, you 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 will get shocked. Um, so and, and then under that, don't think that God is missing things when you sin. Um, don't think that He's missing things that you do in sin. Um, God sees all. He knows your heart. He knows your motives. He knows what's going on. He knows why you're doing what you're doing. He knows you're thinking about it. He sees you do it all the, all the time. So live your life, um, go throughout your life, your hours, with this high awareness of that all you're thinking, all you're speaking, all you're doing, the room that you're in is in the presence of God, that he sees you. And he's watching over you in his loving care, but he's also watching over you and he will see that sin too. He won't, he's not too busy in somewhere else. God is omnipresent. Uh, as David asks in Psalm 139, where can I go from your presence? Where can I hide from your spirit? Nowhere. Uh, God is always with me. When I awake, I'm still with you because you're still with me, he says. I can't go to the, the depths of the earth. I can't hide in a cave and you're not there. You're always with me. And so have this heightened awareness in your lives as a believer that God is always there and he, and he sees you. Number, or not number, letter two, B, uh, B. Be faithful. Be faithful, therefore, knowing that faithfulness, here's what it involves. Faithfulness involves your walking in God's commands from the Bible Okay, so Jeroboam and Nadab, they didn't do this. They worshipped other gods, they set up idols, they, they promoted uh, gross immorality in various ways in their kingdom. Um, so they, they disrespected the commands of God. But you know that faithfulness involves walking in God's commands from the Bible, but also it involves your heart. That's your second, uh, second blank there. 
and, and in your heart loving and appreciating and trusting the Lord. God sees both. And so he wants us obedient to his commands, but he also wants us obedient to his commands with a good heart that trusts him, that loves him, that appreciates him, that believes that he's got our best in mind. God is very pleased with that. And that's what faithfulness, that's what faithfulness is. Um, so Deuteronomy 28, 14 tells us, be faithful, therefore. God has just declared how good he is and how he wants to bless his people in verses 1 through 13 of Deuteronomy 28. And then in, 20, in verse 14, he says, therefore, be faithful, be faithful. Um, he says this in that verse, Deuteronomy 28, 14. Do not turn aside from any of the commands I give you today to the right or to the left, following other gods and serving them. In Deuteronomy 6, 5, he gets at the heart. And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your strength. This is faithfulness. Faithfulness and faithfulness in what we do and faithfulness of heart, loving the Lord. Now see, see, know that as you strive for faithfulness, that God will be faithful as well. Know that God will be faithful to his covenant Okay, now Sunday school people and uh, el else, el others, um, Joyce just stepped out so she can't answer this for you. What is it that is faithful to the covenant? What's that word in the Bible that means faithful to the covenant? Righteousness. righteousness. Very good. My heart is warmed. God is righteous. And you see this in Romans 1. Paul's declaring God is righteous. He's righteous in his covenant. He's righteous to his covenant promises. He's going to be perfectly faithful to fulfill his promises in the covenant. He calls us to be faithful, to be righteous, to fulfill our aspects of the covenant, to worship no other gods, to walk in his ways. Um, but God will be faithful to his covenant, and it's in two ways. He's made two kinds of promises in his covenant, both Old Testament and New Testament, Two things he will fulfill and be faithful to. And the first is this. Number one, to bless you. God will be faithful to his covenant to bless you. Um, he had promised Jeroboam, chapter 11, verse 38. You walk in my ways, I'll bless you. Um, Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 13. He declares to his people through Moses, Deuteronomy 28. This is right before they enter the promised land. Um, he names all these blessings for them in verses 1 through 13. Uh, I'll bless you in your cities. I'll bless you in the country. I'll bless you in your womb. I'll bless you in your fields. I'll, I'll bless your children. All these blessings will come to you. I'll, you'll, you'll, one of you will make loads of, of foreign army uh, soldiers run away from you. Uh, you'll, you'll lend to many, but borrow from none. You'll be in the position of power. I'll bless you. Um, so God is faithful to this, to bless his people, um, or put in this way on your outline there, God will be generous to bless you. That's his disposition. He'll be blender, bl he'll be blederous to bless you. He'll be generous to bless you um, as you live. And here's the key point, not in perfection. That's why the sacrificial systems in the Old Testament, he understands that. Not in perfection. That's why Jesus offers the one perfect sacrifice for your sins. But you're to walk in faithfulness. And here's the key word. Aimed. A-I-M. Aimed. Aimed at being faithful to him. This is why David's so great, even though he's a sinner. Even though he murders. Even though he commits adultery. He is aimed at glorifying God in his life. And with his life, bringing glory to his God in his life. He's aimed at being faithful. And when he's confronted with not being faithful, he repents and starts being faithful again. And that's why the Lord loves him so much. The Lord had provided for David forgiveness of sins. He just wanted faithfulness. And David had this basic uh, life mentality of my goal in life is to be faithful and to be aimed at that. I know I'll sin, but I want to be aimed at being faithful. And when I sin, turn from it and be faithful again, just in the next second. 
And so that's the key. God will be generous to bless you as you live, aimed at being faithful, aimed at being faithful to him. So Deuteronomy 10, 12. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but that you fear the Lord your God? That's being faithful. Know he's there. Know he's present. Know he's watching over you. Know his cause and effect are in place. And part of that fear of the Lord is, his cause and effect is, if I aim myself at being faithful, the effect is blessing. That's fear of the Lord. Knowing that my blessing depends on him. He is the blesser. I can't bless myself by walking into sin. If I walk into sin, that effect of, of discipline will come in. Okay? But, but I, I aim at faithfulness. I aim at faithfulness to serve the Lord my God with it. Here's the rest of Deuteronomy 10. So I'll read it all to you again. Verse 12. And now, O Israel, what does the good Lord God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God and to walk in his ways, the commands, to love him, your heart, to serve the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul. To Jeroboam, and, and here's the first Kings eleven thirty eight. If you do whatever I command you and walk in my ways and do what is right in my eyes, this is to Jeroboam, who's broken away from the son of David. By keeping my statutes and commands as David, my servant, did, I will be with you. I will build you a dynasty as enduring as the one I built for David and will give Israel to you. Psalm 11.5 says, God provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. Get the connection there. He remembers his covenant and he provides food. So God is faithful to his covenant um, uh, to bless. That's part of the covenant. Verses 1 through 13 of, the, 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 uh, of Deuteronomy 18. He's faithful in the covenant to hold up his end and to bless. But he puts that caveat on it. I will bless you as you walk with me. And it's not a, it's not a walking with me in perfection. It's a walking with me with an aim to glorify me, with an aim to be faithful, with a, when I sin, I turn back to God. And I aim back at being like Christ in my character. And God will be generous in blessing us, even with our imperfect obediences to him. But then number two, God is also faithful in his covenant to do what he's promised. And that is this, to discipline you. God is faithful to his covenant. And that, his covenant promise uh, is I see that, you too. I know what's going on. <laughs> We're talking about righteousness here. God being faithful to his covenant. And, and so um, when, when God's people are being disciplined, when they're being punished in the Old Testament, that's not that God has abandoned them. That's not that God is being unfaithful to them. That is God is being faithful to him because he promised when you get out of line, I will discipline you to bring you back so that I can bless you again. God's punishment of his people is his faithfulness to them because he promised to do that to them. That was his covenant agreement with them to not let them live like everybody else lives. If you've been around a long time, I haven't said this in a while, you know, that, that's what my dad used to say to me. To John, I know everyone else's parents let them do that, but I love you and I'm not going to let you do that. I'm not going to let you be like that. Sometimes I've said to my kids, you don't want to be that person. That's not who you want to be. And that's just a different way of phrasing that from my dad. You know, that, that always grabbed me. You know, he, he cared. You know, sure, everyone's doing it. Everyone's saying it's okay. You won't get in trouble, but you don't want to be that. And, and this, is, this is God for us. He's faithful as a parent, like we were kidding earlier during prayer. Our goal as a parent is not to have our kids like us or not to have our parents consider us to be cool. Okay, if that's your goal, you're going to have kids that are going to be a bane to everybody around them, right? They'll be a curse to everybody around them because you've taught them nothing. You've just let them do whatever. Okay, and God is not, God's a loving father and he doesn't let us as his children just do whatever because there's cause and effect. There are consequences. 
If I take revenge on somebody, there's revenge coming back on me. And so God says, don't get involved in that revenge scheme. No Hatfield and McCoys among you. Forgive. That's going to work out better for you. Forgive. Let it go. Don't seek to punish. Okay? Not you as an individual believer. If they get punished by the law, fine. But you don't get back at them. Okay, so God is faithful to his covenant to discipline, to discipline us. And so chapter uh, Deut chapter 28 of Deuteronomy, verses 14 through 16, eight, through 68, he goes through this long list of curses and he reverses all the blessings in that list. And he says, you know, if you don't walk in my ways, if you serve other gods, if you worship other gods, then you'll have to borrow from foreign nations at high interest. And they'll come in at the battle against you and you will lose. One of them will cause, you know, loads of you, I always forget the number, to have to run away. And I won't send the rain to your fields and you won't have abundant harvests because you're not walking in my ways. And this is to get your attention. This is to get your attention so that you walk in my ways. So A there. God is faithful to his covenant to discipline you. And then A, know that God will wisely discipline you as you stray and are unfaithful to him. Okay, so this is what happens to Jeroboam. Um, verses 26 and 27, God, uh, he strays and God disciplines him in his unfaithfulness. And then uh, Jim read for us from 2 Kings uh, 17, um, earlier that that ultimately the discipline that comes upon israel for the wickedness of their kings is exile and god names this is because of the wickedness of your kings and because you people followed after your kings in this in this way and so they experience that god is not mocked they have reaped to their sinful nature and so they they harvest from that sinful nature of the whirlwind b to know that god will wisely discipline you and that's probably the reason for different timing sometimes you've done something and, and there's a better timing to bring about the discipline on you uh, he'll wisely discipline you b understand that his discipline is part of his faithful love to you uh, he establishes that we've looked at that a lot in the last three months hebrews 12 god is acting as a loving father when he brings uh, a little bit of chaos into your life that's associated with the sin that you did okay so um that's part of God's love for you. It's part of his covenant commitment to you to not like let you be like every other kid out there. You know, just uh, uh, getting married and not being committed to your spouse. Uh, and if they haven't committed adultery, they haven't beaten you and you just decide you're, you're bored and you leave and you marry someone else and you treat that, your second spouse the, next, the same way, treat your third spouse the third way, your fourth spouse, that's not, that's not gonna be good for you, okay? And so God's discipline is part of his faithful love to you. He'll bring a little chaos in your life um, out of his love for you to turn you back to him so he can start blessing you again. And then C, also know, don't, now don't get, so this is out of B. Don't think, oh, okay, God's discipline is out of his love for me. So that's pretty good. Oh, that's pretty good. But C, know that it's not fun. His discipline is not fun. It won't be fun. Um, it'll be difficult for you. Um, and so, you know, it wasn't fun for Nadab, was it? <laughs> he dies. It wasn't fun for Jeroboam's family. They all died. That was not, that was not fun. It wasn't fun when they went into exile in 2 Kings uh, 17. God's cause and effect is dependable. Now next, next, number two. Understand deeply, your sin affects, that's affect with an A, it's the verb, your sin affects and hurts, your sin affects and hurts the people who depend on you. Your sin affects and it hurts the people who depend on you. That's what we see in this passage here. And it includes those people who depend on you and those you love. Your sin affects, your sin affects and hurts the people who depend on you, including those you love. And so Jeroboam presumably loved Nadab. Nadab presumably loves his wife and his family and their sin 
affects and hurts those they love. And it affects those who are responsible to them and, and who are depending on them. That is the people in northern Israel. They experience chaos, which eventually ends up in exile uh, at the hand of the Assyrians um, in 722 B.C. Um, so Nadab was sinful, but why was he put to death? Because of the sin of Jeroboam that he walked in. Um, not, not fun. It hurt the people who depend. Jeroboam's sins brought tragedy to his son and to all dis, his descendants and his family. Um, recognize, uh, recognize this, that your sin affects the people around you. David's sin, when he sins with Bathsheba and then uh, gets Bathsheba's husband to be killed in battle. Um, the rest of, and that's what you have listed there, 2 Kings or Second Samuel 11 through 20, that's chaos. Ver, chapter 11 is the Bathsheba sin. Chapters 12 through 20 is all the chaos that happens in David's family with his sons and that happens to Israel as a whole that spills out of his sin with Bathsheba. So the Lord forgives him and all that, but he's brought chaos He's affected, his sin has affected not just him. It's affected those he loves, his sons, his daughter Tamar, um, and then those who are in Israel as they're in war and civil war at, at, at points. Um, and that's chapters and chapters. And the rest of David's kingship is not that, not that pretty, so to speak. So A, there in your outline, your sin may put others in bad situations. So that's one way your sin affects people. Um, so um, 14, 14 there we looked at before. Genesis 9, 20 through 25. You know, that's the situation. Noah gets out of the boat with his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then he plants a vineyard, um, some, symbolic of the, the promised land. You know, this is Moses writing to his people that after they come out of Egypt, you know, the promised land would be like a vineyard there. So that's what's going on there. That's a funny statement. And Noah planted... Or as we have a Noah video narrated by uh, James Earl Jones, and he says, and Noah planted a vineyard. <laughs> it's grand and glorious. Uh, but, but he gets drunk on the wine. And Ham comes in, and whatever happens there, he sees his father's nakedness, whether that was incest with his mother or, or, or whether that was just seeing uh, Noah's, uh, Noah, his father, naked. And you know what happens there? You've got to pay close attention. Ham doesn't get cursed. Ham's the one who commits the sin. You know who gets cursed? Cursed be Canaan, his son, his prized son. Ham has affected his son, Canaan. And so Israel comes in under Joshua, and who do they wipe out? The Canaanites, the cursed son of Ham. So Ham affects his family. God gives the command under Joshua, completely wipe them out. Don't leave anyone breathing, just like you see here with Jeroboam's descendants, that no one's left breathing who was related to Jeroboam. Um, so in our modern society, you know this is true. This is not just something in, in the Bible. If your father robs a bank and gets caught, you grow up without a father for a few years, don't you? Your family's impoverished. Um, if, your fa if your father uh, uh, commits adultery, then you grow up in a split home because your parents have gotten divorced or your mother does. What you do, your sin affects the circumstances, the circumstances of others. Uh, B, so your sin may put others in bad situations. So you sin as the father and you put your kids in a bad situation. That is, they grow up with a split home or impoverished and bad Christmases and Thanksgivings because they have to visit both places. Uh, B, uh, your sin will give a bad example for others too, those you love and those who are dependent upon you. Your sin will give a bad example, including those you love, like your kids, leading them by your example into sin and its bad consequences. So look at verse 26 in this passage, chapter 15, verse six, 26. What's it say about Nadab? He doesn't just perish because of Jeroboam, his father. He himself walks in the sins of his father. 
So what Jeroboam has done is he's given his, his son an example of how to walk, of how to live. And that means Nadab lives and he doesn't push back the curse that Ahijah, that Ahijah had pronounced on his father. He doesn't push it back. He experiences it because he walks in the example of his father. You see other kings of the Israelites or other kings of the Judahites, the sons of David, who are receive a curse, but then they turn in faithfulness and God extends the curse onto the next generation. Like Hezekiah, right? You know, he shows all the treasuries of the temple of the Lord to the Babylonians. And God says, big mistake. That was, a, that was you trying to establish an alliance, a friendship with Babylon for their protection. And you're not to do that as king, right? The king is not to look to foreign nations for protection. And God says, but because you've been faithful to, to me, this will not happen during your lifetime. And Hezekiah unfaithfully says, good. <laughs> But, but God's people can push back through faithfulness. But Nadab doesn't because he's got this bad example from his father. And you as an individual Christian, with those who are under you, whether you're a boss or a coach or a parent or a teacher, whatever it is, those who are affected by you can see your example and then walk in it and have the consequences of their own sins come upon them. And you've been a cause of them walking in sin and experiencing those consequences. And so parents hear that. You don't want that for your kids. Okay, lots of stuff in scripture about that. Uh, that parents who walk in unfaithfulness, this spills out in the lives of their kids. I've seen it as a pastor in the church. You know, of a, you know, I know, I can think of now a, a mother, a faithful mother, very just tremendously devoted uh, to the Lord and always brought her, always brought her kids to church and had had one one son, and, and uh, the uh, this son just adored his father, and his father was not a believer, and his father did drugs. His father just kind of uh, um, uh, scoffed at the things of God, and, and so the, the the kid, the son, ended up doing the same, um, walking in his father's way, even though he had this excellent example. Uh, from his mom, still that example of how you be a, a real guy, a real man out there was the example of his father. And, 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 and his father uh, led his son into the way he's living his life now. Now see, see, the sin of the Israelite kings like Nadab, the sin of the Israelite kings like Nadab hurt the people who depended on them. So this is just case in point. We're just pointing to this passage and saying this is true. And eventually caused their punishment in exile from the promised land. Okay, so the kings of Israel, we're to see here as we read First and Second Kings, the sins of the Israelite kings um, brought hurt to the people who depended on them, both in their day and then eventually it brought the hurt of punish, punishment in exile, which we saw in Second Kings 17.6.3. Jim read this for us. In the ninth year of Hosea, the last king of Israel, in the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and deported the Israelites to Assyria. The king of Assyria settled them in Halah, in Gazan, on the Habor River, and in the towns of the Medes. All this took place because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God. Um, they worshipped other gods and followed the practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before them, the practices of the Canaanites, as well as the practices of the kings the kings of Israel had introduced. So you got both there. When the people are exiled, it's like, yeah, they've got their own sins, but the kings of Israel are named. They're the ones who introduce these practices. And so you don't want to provide, you don't want to introduce these practices for the sake of those who you love, for the sake of those who are around you um, in, your, in your life. So the sin, the sin of you affects not just yourself, but those around you. Bear that in mind and have that be a motivation for you. God wants that to be a motivation to you. When you're like, you know what? I can handle the consequence. I know what's coming, but I'll, I'll deal with it. Think about those who depend on you. Think about those who love you and the consequences they'll experience because of that sin and have that uh, propel you into faithfulness.